Super Mario Odyssey is the third collectathon Mario, and it came after four course clear games. Though it could be argued that Super Mario Galaxy borrows level design tropes from the collectathon, it often sees you following a linear path to your objective, even in more open ended levels like Honey Hive or Beach Bowl. Galaxy 2 practically cemented this direction, while 3D Land and World marinated in it. 64 and Sunshine focused on creating larger, more intricate sandboxes with multiple separate objectives. Sunshine could even be seen as inching closer to a course clear philosophy by limiting your shine choice. This isn't to say that the approach of Galaxy and other course clear games is one I dislike, just that there's a clear divide between the two that even Nintendo have acknowledged. For now, I'd like to put a little bow on top of this odd trilogy of Mario games that have always been more to my taste. Despite how harsh I may have been on 64 and Sunshine, and how harsh I'm likely about to be on Odyssey, it's also important to not let my praises go unsung. I really enjoy all three of these games, but I'm not convinced any one of them truly reaches my ideal Mario collectathon. Let's talk a bit about why that is. This is a Super Mario Odyssey retrospective. <laughs> I am going to assume that you've watched my videos on 64 and Sunshine, but just in case you haven't, I'll give a very brief rundown on my thoughts overall. Super Mario 64 is an excellent transition to 3D, spearheading the collectathon genre with imaginative, dreamlike sandboxes that you could explore to your heart's content. It was largely weakened by an aging control scheme and camera. Though the DS remake, depending on who you are, might fix the controls and camera, it was still shackled by an even greater issue the boot-out system, which punished you both for failure and success. While this doesn't seem to bother many other players, for me it is their ever-present Achilles heel. It ruins entire levels for me in 64, and threatens to ruin the whole experience of Sunshine. Sunshine, though, has a stronger sense of immersion. They played on 64's ability to craft imaginative locations and took that to the next level. They made an entire island resort for Mario to hang out in, one that felt more or less authentic. Some of the objectives weren't as strong, but that didn't matter much in the moment. Exploring each level was a relaxing experience, and that remains its greatest strength. Just like 64, however, it threatens to cannibalize its greatest strength with an unnecessarily linear and restrictive progression structure. Paired with the ever-frustrating boot-out system, I can't say Sunshine necessarily succeeds where 64 fails. It just took those two extremes and amplified them. Higher highs and lower lows. It's no secret that I have a vendetta against the bootout system, which is why I'd like to start by saying that one of Odyssey's greatest strengths is that it removed that system in its entirety. Collecting a Power Moon, this game's equivalent to the Power Star or Shine Sprite, will cause a flashy animation where Mario and his partner Cappy jump up into the air to the tune of a catchy jingle. After which, you can go back to exploring the level. This seemingly simple change means the world to me. Exploring has a renewed sense of flow to it, since you aren't being thrown out every couple minutes. You can breathe in the New Donk City air, get lost in the trenches of Bablane, find yourself stranded in the middle of nowhere. The possibilities are endless, as this is now a road trip. It marries the disconnected level theming of 64 and the connective tissue of Sunshine. How poetic. Each kingdom has a purpose. Bowser is traveling between them to steal a magical item or artifact for his wedding. You get that classic road trip vibe, but through realistic humans and forks with chef hats. The disconnected becomes connected, foregoing the drawbacks that come with either approach. I've always loved this idea that Mario constructs its universe in a completely nonsensical way. The Paper Mario games, especially the Thousand Year Door and Super Paper Mario, feature new species that often defy conventional logic. Flipside, which most people don't seem to like, is actually one of my favorite Mario locations. It follows the same bonkers ideology of Odyssey. A world full of weird block people? Doesn't get more Mario than that. Of course, that's not even to mention the entirety of Superstar Saga, which has a fully realized nation of bean people, but I think you get the point here. I like when Mario crosses over into strange new lands, ones that don't only consist of traditional enemies. Maybe it falls too fast into a few stereotypes, snow levels, beach levels, etc., but even those stereotypes buck tradition in some way. 
When you first enter the Snow Kingdom, it's very traditional. You're thrown into the middle of a snowstorm. However, eventually you're dropped from this familiar setup into the decidedly unfamiliar Shavarian racetrack, with adorable round seal creatures. This amalgamation of Northern European and Russian cultures is a unique subversion of the traditional ice level. It's the same with the Desert Kingdom, which has hit a cold patch, or the Wooded Kingdom, which is a forest growing around a mechanical construction. With the exception of Bablain, which really is just another beach level, each theme is distinct. Those are just the more generic ones. We've got kingdoms based around food, top hats, dinosaurs, feudal Japan, you name it. Odyssey even manages to inherit that change over time you'd see in 64 and Sunshine, but this time without getting the boot. The Desert Kingdom starts out frozen over, and you have to solve that problem, which eventually leads to the dead rising at nightfall, which eventually leads to a restored desert. New Donk City begins with a boss fight, after which it sees you slowly restoring the city's power, put together a band, and take part in Fireworks Festival. Sure, some of the triple moons take you back to the Odyssey, but this is very rare, and usually only to take you away from a dead end. Using your coins, you can buy special outfits for Mario to wear, and better blend in with his environment. Scuba gear, swimsuit, poncho, caveman, chef, scientist, top hat polygons. Though they may be cosmetic, they're still an incentive to collect both regular and purple coins throughout the world. We've moved past the days of everything feeding back into a main collectible. You obtain something more for going out of your way to explore, a reward that fits with the theming and allows you to customize Mario in a never-before-seen way. Luigi might not be playable, but you run the full gambit of different Marios, and to me, that makes all the difference. 100 coin challenges have been moved to the secondary collectible. Purple coins, which allow you to purchase costumes specific to the world you're in, as well as souvenirs to place in the Odyssey. It's a perfect way to tie it all back into that overarching theme. Collecting these coins is still just as fun, as they're often cleverly hidden. This time, though, you get a different reward for each coin milestone, instead of just more shine sprites, so going after them feels more consistently rewarding. The average world size is no joke. The Desert Kingdom and the Metro Kingdom are pretty huge for Mario standards, especially coming off the smaller world sizes of 64 and Sunshine. It makes exploring them for secrets even more fun, without crossing over into bloated open-world territory. New Donk City has something for you around every building, every city block, every back alley, every rooftop, everywhere. It's a dense metropolis where you can take advantage of that natural platforming I mentioned in my Sunshine video. This kingdom is the epitome of that concept, where you swing on light posts and wall jump in between buildings. You get classic Mario platforming, but this time you use it to find secrets and other collectibles. You have to climb the volcano in Luncheon Kingdom to fight the boss on top of a cauldron. The Wooded Kingdom sees you weaving in and out of a large mechanical structure. A majority of the secrets exist inside the grooves of said structure, hiding underneath cliff sides. Many of the sections where you're transported to a disconnected space are saved because they feel... well... connected. When you travel underground in the Desert Kingdom, you see the source of the colder weather, and find yourself in an expansive underground cave full of ancient ruins. New Donk City's Underground is a hybrid between a sewer and a power plant, where the end objective is you turning on the city's power. The Blaine has a locked lighthouse that you can enter by swimming underground. You also do this in the Lake Kingdom to bypass a wall. Your immersion is rarely broken, like it so often was in Sunshine, and it really complements the shorter length of these more contained sections. Once again, I coin Odyssey's sense of immersion as one of its greatest strengths, even if it is constructed with strange components. It's like I said in my Sunshine video, Mario does not have to be realistic to be immersive, it just needs that connective tissue to trap you for as long as it needs. It helps that exploring these worlds has been made more fun thanks to Mario's expanded moveset. Nothing against the games that happened in between, but Mario has never felt as fun to experiment with since Sunshine. I'm largely okay with it, as the controls for something like 3D World make sense for its more contained and simplistic level design, but that would not fly for a collectathon. Bounding through levels with triple jumps and dives is a large part of why exploration feels so gratifying. I specifically love how invisible coins are hidden all over the place as a reward for your platforming ingenuity. I swear to you, if you see an alcove in a place you couldn't possibly get to by normal means, there will be something there as an acknowledgement. You might have to master the cat throw dive jump, 
as is the case under Toast Arena. Near the boss fight, there are several pillars on each side that look inaccessible. In any other game, there would be an invisible wall, or simply no way to get to those pillars. In Odyssey, though, not only can you reach the top of those pillars with a well-timed triple jump into a cap throw, there are coins up there waiting for you. As if that wasn't enough, there's an even harder jump to get on top of the entrance building. This one is even more insane from the outside looking in, and you might even doubt that it's possible to get up there. You have to stand on a very small platform and inch your way up the wall carvings. Eventually, you'll make it up and see a stash of coins. What this means is that it was always possible to get up there, and the game knew it. It rewarded you for thinking outside the box. It encouraged me to do all kinds of things in each level. If you think something might have a secret, nine times out of ten, you'd be right. Under the brutal boss platform in Steam Gardens, there are incredibly narrow beams you can reach with a cap jump. If you walk towards the main platform, there will be lines of hidden coins. You can find them on top of the entrances to practically any location. Since coins serve an actual purpose in this game, it feels so satisfying to find them in the most unexpected places. On far-off platforms in this chain shop bouncing minigame room, on the windows of buildings in New Donk City, and even on the ramparts of Bowser's Castle. Those large statues of Bowser on the pagodas, you can jump on those and find purple coins alongside other goodies. They actually figured you'd be curious enough to risk your life and explore something that most other games wouldn't even program collision for. Seriously, this is some out-of-bounds exploration, and no other collectathon I've played is quite that thorough with its secret placement. I was addicted to Odyssey my first couple playthroughs for all of these reasons and more. It was a cathartic, painless road trip. So, yay! Odyssey solved the problem, right? It cultivated the flowers and culled the weeds. There's no boot-out system here to interrupt that beautiful feeling of immersion, and you're allowed to tackle any power moon you want. There also aren't any required power moons, save for a few boss fights. We're back to the 64 system. Collect an arbitrary amount of power moons to progress. You're given complete freedom to enact this road trip however you see fit. It's great. I love it. But it's not going to be that simple today. Odyssey eliminated my biggest problem with the previous games, and nearly perfected that feeling of immersion they were building toward. In that sense, it feels like the logical conclusion. Yet, collecting power moons somehow doesn't feel as exciting as stars or shine sprites before it. Even the worst missions in previous games felt satisfying to clear because your reward was a tangible collectible that got you closer to finishing the game. Cleaning eel teeth was a pretty big step toward the end, as was finding practically any star in 64. As such, the game placed priority on each of them. In Odyssey, that importance is dulled. There are so many moons in the game. So many, in fact, that important objectives have to give you three moons instead of one. Defeating a boss feels about as exciting as a regular objective in previous games. Raiding New Donk City in the rain and clearing out an electric caterpillar is about as involved as riding the sandbird or defeating the wiggler. But then, why would you do this if you could also get three power moons no problem by kicking a rock into a wall or sitting on a bench? Which isn't to say I don't enjoy power moons like bench friends. It's a cute secret for cheering up a man who just wants a bench friend. I'm fine with a few of these here and there. What bothers me is the sheer number of times Odyssey is content doing something like this and rewarding you with a power moon. Walking a dog, wearing a specific costume, planting a bean sprout from across a gigantic map and waiting for it to grow, trace walking, face matching, you get the picture. Each of those activities are repeated multiple times in different worlds. There are multiple dogs in multiple kingdoms, there are several instances where you have to find bean sprout seeds from across the map, you have to wear a specific costume in almost every single kingdom that just results in an instant moon. Sure, the first time you get a moon like this, it's cute. But the second, the third, the fourth... Repetition digs deep into your soul and sucks the life out of some genuinely interesting worlds. Repetition and structure aren't inherently bad. There's a reason the 100 coin and 8 red coin challenges in previous games were repeated for every world. 
They were fun challenges that in most ways encouraged thorough exploration of the level, pushing you closer to mastery. Having to carry one of four items across the map multiple times is not an activity worth repeating ad infinitum, and unfortunately there's no getting around that for me. It harkens back to less interesting challenges in Sunshine, like the Watermelon Escort mission. Moons can be so damn obvious sometimes, I'll accidentally run into them. Accidentally run into the main collectible. They're treated with the same importance as a coin as far as challenge level is concerned. On average, moons require more effort since many of them are locked behind specific challenge rooms or bosses, but that average is dragged down by the moons where you ground pound a shiny spot or kick a rock or buy it from the fucking store. A large majority of actual kingdom content is made up of stuff like that, and it's a real shame since a lot of the other moons are fairly well placed. But Blaine has a lot of underwater exploration, made infinitely more fun using the capturable cheap cheeps. Exploring ravines like a submariner, combing the coral reefs to find all kinds of hidden stuff, is a fun new challenge for the player. It's probably some of the best underwater exploration in a collectathon that I've played, since the cheap cheap capture is so fun to toy around with, and the level geometry intentionally obscures secrets. It forces you to engage with the underwater labyrinth. Even above the water, you can capture the gushions for air exploration. You have to balance the vertical and horizontal gains you make with your decreasing water levels. It feels like a more overpowered and focused version of what Flood was. It's used to great effect when fighting the boss, where air positioning is key. Perhaps more fun, though, are the times where you have to get it somewhere farther away by soaking it in puddles that act as checkpoints. In this little ravine, there are several pools of water throughout that initially mean absolutely nothing. You get to the end of a decent spike ball challenge, grab a power moon, and get closer to fighting the boss. Unbeknownst to the player, however, Captain Toad is above that moon, and the way to get to it is by dragging a gushin all the way through the ravine and recharging him at those pools. Surprisingly, it took me a long time to figure this out on my first playthrough, because gushins are far enough away that you probably wouldn't think to use one right off the bat. You have to see the pools and connect them with the Gushin's abilities in order to find Captain Toad and win yourself a well-hidden moon. These are definitely the best moons in Odyssey, where you have to drag a cheap cheap through a long underwater tunnel to avoid drowning, when you run a bullet bill in between the moving pillars and slide into a secret room, when you slip through the geometry of a level in a 2D section to find a hidden moon, when you fall in steam gardens and end up in a completely new location. It is so much more rewarding to find those secrets. Moons such as those will forever remain in my memory as some of the most interesting secrets in a Mario game, because they're well hidden. You have to think outside the box to obtain them. It's the same reason why I love hunting for blue coins. Many of them were really well hidden, and genuine secrets to find. I enjoy using uproots to reach hidden nuts in hard to reach areas, or using pokios to bounce my way across the sides of the walls. That's just what I like to do in these games. Odyssey is at its worst for me when that stuff isn't happening. And that isn't just a target on the back of the dog-walking filler moons. In fact, one of my biggest issues with Odyssey is its reliance on challenge rooms. Now, here's a brief background on me. I don't have a lot of experience with the Course Clear Mario titles. I frankly prefer Collectathon Mario games and have just never played the classic titles. This is a large part of why 3D World has never resonated with me as strongly since it is, by all accounts, a literal translation from 2D to 3D. It is course clear 3D Mario perfected. I can admit that I've been harsh on it over the years, perhaps unfairly. For a long time, I hated it for being something that I didn't want it to be, rather than simply being content with what it was. With the release of Odyssey and the acknowledgement that 3D Mario has two distinct styles, I can appreciate 3D World in a new context. It has some of the best level design in the entire series, that much is for certain. While it is a little easier than I'd like, it crams so many creative level themes into one package and paces them out really well. There are one or two central gimmicks for the level to play around with, several collectibles hidden to reward risky play, and the levels have a natural evolution from start to flagpole. Super Mario Odyssey has a problem. It's billed as a collectathon, but maybe 40% of its content is clearly something you'd see in a course clear game. Jumping across rotating platforms and buildings for about 5 seconds with an optional moon hidden somewhere along the way. 
Seriously, compare the substance of these rooms to any 3D world level. Here's a jumping floor panel level where it gets progressively more difficult as you go along. You have to deal with laser circles and other enemies along that path. New concepts are being thrown at you left and right. You have to keep your double cherry until the end of the level. A real pain in the ass if you're going for all the green stars. It's a creative level with three secret green stars to collect, one of which in its own puzzle room. I will always remember that level. I'll always remember the first time I was introduced to the double cherry and the subsequent levels in which it was used. I'll always remember the speed panels and the unique uses it had for the various levels that featured it. Super Mario Odyssey simply doesn't rival that creativity. Often you'll just be asked to navigate platforms through fog, or jump across poles, or jump through rotating geometry that looks like it came straight out of sunshine judging by how basic it feels. They don't last long at all, and though some of them offer a decent platforming challenge, they're so basic that it's hard to remember them. They're just another way to get moons that are completely divorced from the kingdoms themselves. Especially the ones you access using rockets, this is straight out of the Sunshine playbook. Simplistic levels that have nothing to do with anything, floating out in space, disrupting the flow of normal play. It's trying to have it both ways. Nintendo wanted to embrace their collectathon roots, but seemingly didn't understand what that meant. So, we get a bunch of course clear challenges in what should be a collectathon, where you're immersed in colorful worlds and asked to explore them for secrets. Now, as I mentioned, there are several linear challenges I enjoy, which are often baked into the levels themselves. Inside the Pyramid is a good example. You've got to deal with bullet bills and 2D sections in an acceptable evolution until you escape the Pyramid and fight a Brutal. It lasts long enough that you could consider it a level in something like 3D World without ruining your immersion. You're still in Toast Arena, and you don't end by capturing a rocket and leaving, you end on top of the Pyramid, making more progress toward the main quest. It reminds me of jumping into the volcano or pyramid in Super Mario 64, sub-areas that have their own identity and exist within the world. Another thing 64 did was hide a few of those sub-areas, like the Tall Tall Mountain Slide, making it more satisfying to find them. It also kept those sub-areas to a minimum. In fact, some worlds didn't even have them. Sunshine increased that counter, and Odyssey quadrupled it. Every world has an abundance of sub-areas through cap doors or rockets. Nearly all of them have nothing to do with anything, besides sharing a main capture or stage mechanic, like the zippers in Lakeside, that could have been more effectively used within the kingdom itself. While they are an unnecessary distraction, I can mostly forgive them for at least being mechanically satisfying in most instances. Sunshine had this as well, for as immersion-breaking as its sub-areas were, it could at least rely on that mechanical challenge to get by. In Odyssey's case, many of them are slower paced and focused on either exploring one small room or solving a platforming puzzle. One of my favorites is where you have to guide these stone tanuki statues on top of P-switches and figure out how to get the extra collectible at the same time. You actually need to leave one of the statues at the beginning of the level and then do a cap throw dive across the empty space where the bridge used to be. Coming to that conclusion falls in line with the critical thought you put into the larger worlds. I also can't get enough of these 2D sections, which play with the level geometry in a genius way. Whether it wraps around the cylindrical wall, dots the seafloor, or wraps around a circle, it's always interesting to enter one of these 8-bit warp pipes and see what the game asks of you. Honestly, I think adding a lot more of these platforming challenges would have been better than the platforming-focused challenge rooms. The 2D sections are far shorter than the challenge rooms, still ask you to find a hidden moon in a well-placed hiding spot, and still exist within the kingdoms themselves. They already act as short distractions, so adding more of them in strange locations would have been welcome. Odyssey did not need these sub-areas, and they affect the pacing in a negative way overall, but to say it's the game's biggest problem would be overstating things a bit. No, ironically I believe that Odyssey's biggest problem is the exact same problem Sunshine in 64 had. It has horrible pacing. Except this time it goes the opposite way. 64 and Sunshine struggled with their pacing due specifically to their bootout system. Odyssey struggles precisely because it doesn't have the bootout system. After some engaging boss fights, a joyful ending sequence, and a cute ending cutscene, you find yourself in the Mushroom Kingdom. 
It's such a cool throwback to Super Mario 64. There's even a polygonal costume to run around in. Yet, except for a few Easter eggs like draining the moat, looking up the sun, etc., it's a surface level callback. Jumping into paintings will see you fighting remixed versions of the same bosses. Challenge rooms consist of face matching and other useless Mario Party minigames. Nothing about the actual world calls back to Peach's Castle in any meaningful way. It's just a method to shovel repeat content down your throat. But it doesn't end there. Throughout the game, you'll encounter moon rocks. You can't do anything with them, and it really bugged me on my first playthrough. Turns out they're for the post-game. When you activate one, a bunch of new moons appear. And to put this charitably, they suck. Well, okay, they don't suck in a vacuum, but when considered within the context of the game itself, they're a really dumb concept. Are you ready to basically play the game a second time? To travel back to every world and do the exact same bonus rooms but with slight modifiers? Are you ready to walk more dogs, hit more vultures, pound more ground? I hope so, because that's all you'll be doing from now on. The exact same content as before, in slightly different locations with tiny distinctions and a few new moons and challenge rooms. About the best thing I could say is that the bonus rooms are often more challenging, but that really isn't saying much. It's the same thing Sunshine did with its sub-areas, where you were forced to come back with Flood and complete the 8 red coin challenges. Except Sunshine has 120 Shine Sprites, whereas Odyssey has 880 unique moons. You can only collect around 350 of those on a first playthrough. They lock more than half the moon count behind the post game. Hint art, which was actually one of my favorite parts of the Any% percent, now feels obnoxious because they throw like 20 of them at you all in one world. I really liked trying to make sense of these riddles and finding the moons associated with them, but at some point it felt like overkill. I was satisfied by the already existing hint art, there didn't need to be more of them to pad out the game. There didn't need to be achievements that you have to collect one by one. There didn't need to be purchasable moons. Look, I understand why the statement this game has too much content might not make any sense. How can a game possibly have too much content anyway, especially when most of it is optional? Here's the thing, in a collectathon, at least a good one, almost everything can be considered optional. Most of us still fully complete them because it's a satisfying feeling. They're built to be played multiple times. You can show off your mastery by completing them faster than ever before, flowing through each objective because you know where everything is and what you have to do. That's part of the reason why the bootout system became so repetitive, and why Odyssey flows so much better than the two games preceding it. However, its biggest downfall is ironically a problem those two games never had. 64 and Sunshine had a respectable main collectible count, even if Sunshine technically had less with the blue coin system. Nevertheless, I still fully complete those games when I revisit them, and it's a blast. I love blitzing through each world, doing everything there is to do, and then moving on to the next. I love hunting for blue coins, finding a hundred coins, it's all so relaxing. Pacing-wise, you're always hanging out in each world for just the right amount of time before moving on to the next. Finishing them 100% is intrinsically satisfying, even if not always extrinsically rewarding. Odyssey is definitely more extrinsically rewarding. You unlock additional kingdoms by collecting more moons, but it certainly isn't intrinsically rewarding. You can't have a satisfying 100% experience with Odyssey, because its moon count is already padded enough during the any percent. Pseudo-completing your first visit to each world is about as much work as fully completing 64 and Sunshine. But then the game just keeps going. You do the same challenges over and over again, you go back to the same worlds for seemingly no reason, you collect new moons that I can only describe using the word filler, you basically just play the game twice and then complete a hard platforming challenge, one that is paced way worse than the final challenge levels in the course clear games. Because again, your extrinsic reward for collecting a bunch of moons in a collectathon is a hard course clear challenge. It isn't a new world or a new move to make exploring worlds more satisfying or a new character to switch up your next playthrough. It's a remnant from a type of Mario game that this should not be trying to emulate. Why then does Odyssey feel the need to shove so much extraneous content into its runtime? 
I believe it's to account for the fact that the bootout system no longer exists. I really do think that's all there is to it. Do you truly believe Odyssey would still have this many moons if the bootout system still existed? Clearly there was a problem during development, a problem that likely said, this game will be full price, so it cannot be this short. This is yet another reason I despise the hours equals dollar signs approach, because it needlessly adds on top of games that can't handle that weight anymore. 64 and Sunshine padded out their runtimes to such a degree that we were essentially forced to remember everything. Especially in Sunshine, where you had to do every Shine Sprite in order no matter what. That's why the most memorable moons in Odyssey are the ones that reward you with triple moons, because those are not concerned at all with free level exploration. Often free level exploration had to be facilitated through 64's miscellaneous challenges or Sunshine's blue coins. Since the bootout system already existed, it padded out the runtime by quite a bit, ballooning those games' average runtimes. If you took out the extraneous moons in Odyssey, which I consider almost 60% of its moons, you would end up with a game that lasts at most 7 or 8 hours, which for the gamers of today is apparently not good enough. Odyssey couldn't afford to just do what the other Mario games did, justify that runtime by making a game that's replayable. Since this game is on the Nintendo Switch, and Nintendo are seemingly obsessed with designing games around a hardware philosophy now, Odyssey necessitated an amount of moons that could be obtained in short bursts and last people dozens and dozens of hours. What we ended up with is a game that is fun in very, very short bursts and nothing else. Thus, Odyssey has an identity crisis. For example, one of the defining traits of a collectathon is the hub world. Often you're allowed to explore for new levels, select them out of order, and experiment with your new moveset. Peach's Castle and Isle Delfino did this really well. Super Mario Odyssey doesn't have a hub world, which feels so unbefitting of the subgenre it's attempting to emulate. I understand that this is a globe-trotting road trip adventure story and that its progression structure would make a hub world harder to implement, but it already lets you pick between kingdoms at various points reminiscent of the progression structure in 64 and Sunshine. To not have a hub world diminishes the impact of the souvenirs you collect. Imagine if the Odyssey itself was larger, maybe even the size of the Comet Observatory. You'd get to see it fill up with little trinkets as the game goes on, and maybe you could even collect residents of the other kingdoms along the way. More importantly, being able to explore it for some bonus secrets and pick your next kingdom based on your moon count likely would have helped Odyssey feel a little more natural. As it stands, each kingdom really pushes you toward that triple moon, and by the time you collect it, you'll already be set to leave. Having nothing to do in between can quickly make this structure repetitive. All I'm asking for here is a system similar to the one in Galaxy 2. The hub for that game isn't extraordinary, but at least you could explore it every once in a while. The real kicker is that the Galaxy games really didn't even need a hub world, because they were course clear Mario games that would benefit from a level select. Odyssey, the actual collectathon, doesn't have one for whatever reason. Working on a new hub world would have been far more lucrative time investment than padding the game into oblivion. Hell, it would have been a better time investment than making any of the challenge rooms. I don't know why priority was given to a world like Bablane, and then seemingly no work went into the far more interesting Ruined Kingdom. I don't even know why Lakeside and Bablane are separate entities. It seems like a decision made only to buff up the kingdom count. Actually, if they were to have made Lakeside a secret area in Bablane, it would have made for a better overall kingdom, but instead we're stuck with two decent kingdoms forcibly ripped apart, and a few kingdoms that can barely even be considered kingdoms since you only fight bosses. Seriously, why are they called the Cloud Kingdom or the Ruined Kingdom? They are literally boss platforms, which again is something you would find in 3D World. Think about how much impact a Bowser fight would have had in a fully fleshed out Cloud Kingdom world, or fuck, even just a platforming challenge like in 64. Without that buildup, it's literally just a place to fight Bowser. 
but oh, there's still a goddamn moon rock there, as if to imply this place can still be considered a full kingdom, everyone. Don't worry, you'll get your money's worth. Don't worry. The ruined kingdom hurts the most. I see so much potential here. The boss fight is one of the best in the game, both for how out of place and mechanically satisfying it is. In a game that's already pretty bonkers, this is the kind of strange that crosses over into the macabre. I could see the Ruin Kingdom as an analog for the ghost houses in past Mario titles, a drab, gothic nightmare with booze and other new scary creatures. Again, it would have been a better addition than fucking Bablane, but we seemingly needed to fulfill our bog standard level quota here. I know Bonaton is kinda what I just described, but that kingdom is really damn disappointing. It's literally just a tutorial world, with one room in it. It's a little more substantial than the boss kingdoms, and that sucks because this is the first spark of life in a series that has needed it for so terribly long. Don't get me wrong, I love the creativity in Odyssey, but it feels like only a half step towards something greater. Once again, there's a game I need to bring up one of my favorite games of all time to this very day. Toy Story 2 Buzz Lightyear to the Rescue. I know, it's a weird pick. This is a game that was presumably full price when it came out, has 10 worlds to explore, and can be beaten 100% in about 4 or 5 hours at most. I can imagine that it could have extended that runtime by quite a lot had it opted for the bootout system similar to the Mario games, and that's the reason it has remained one of my favorite games to replay. I can go back to Toy Story 2 any day of the week and just complete it. It's decently fun to explore each world and complete the objectives. There's no reliance on subrooms at all. Every single challenge is contained within the worlds themselves. Andy's room manages to feel expansive, because each of the challenges are hidden in the various rooms of his house, and you're asked to comb all of it to collect everything. It lends itself well to natural platforming, since you're a toy exploring a house. Bookshelves, boxes, even furniture are fun to jump around on since they're built into the environment. There's a certain repetition to the structure, for sure. Collect five unique MacGuffins, collect 50 coins, defeat a boss, play a minigame, and find a secret token. It's incredibly simple, but that doesn't hamper the level design. Each world is about the size of a world from 64, maybe a bit smaller. There's about as much to do, and it doesn't need to shove a bunch of filler into it all. I can't imagine Toy Story 2 being any different than it is and still being fun. Because despite how easy it can sometimes be, or how repetitive the structure is, or how simple the boss fights are, none of its elements feel extraneous. It is so fun to master, it's so fun to play again and again, it's so fun to engage with it on all of its terms. It isn't padded in any way I can conceive, even if that means it had to be a much shorter game than any of the Mario collectathons. When I go back to play Odyssey, I am forced to do it any percent, which is admittedly fun at some points. I am forced to collect whatever I see in each world, move on to the next, fight a few bosses, and beat the game. Sure, for some, maybe that's alright. I know a few people who don't fully complete 64 or Sunshine or Banjo-Kazooie or basically any collectathon ever. That any percent playthrough is still really fun and unique. A far cry from the generic aesthetics we were used to seeing in Mario games for such a long time, and unmarred by the bootout system that robbed those earlier titles of their much needed fluidity. Unique worlds, new characters, and a free range of movement that is insanely satisfying to play around with. A bright, memorable soundtrack, a new horizon. I'll always be happy that this game experimented, that it rose above the generic, that it dabbled in weird vocal tracks, that it is a standout, memorable Mario platformer above all else. I just wish I could end my playthroughs and feel as content as I do when I finish something like Toy Story 2. Unfortunately, despite all the issues it fixed, I don't believe Odyssey even fully understands what it is. For as cheerful and fun as it appears on the surface, Further playthroughs have only revealed more cracks in that exterior. If the game doesn't even understand what it wants to be, where does that leave the player? It's a bittersweet end to the current trilogy of Mario Collectathons. Three games that have some goddamn high potential. Out of all the Collectathons I've played, the 3D Mario titles are not necessarily my favorites, but they've always pained me for having elements that are so close to being brilliant. As the series has moved forward, it's gotten better, worse, and more confused. I'm not sure what the future holds, but if we ever do see another collectathon out of the Italian plumber, I really hope it's just a game that commits to what it wants to be. 
unconstrained by any outside pressures, a game that doesn't have to pad itself out to justify a price tag, a game that is just allowed to be. Odyssey, flawed as it might be, is a truly remarkable game in terms of its presentation. It felt like the first new Mario game after years and years of sterile, boring, predictable visuals, story beats characters, and level design. Odyssey stands in the face of that stagnant past, paving the way to a more hopeful future. I really hope Nintendo keep finding ways to push the plumber to new heights. I'll always be waiting for them to make a collectathon truly worthy of the Mario name. Gonna start.